morning, everyone. We are in the midst of a study about study. We're working on how it is that we can study the Bible in better ways. Kind of this introductory, well, we had an introductory kind of conversation about the study itself in the first lesson. Lesson two is really about picking the most crucial thing you need when it comes to studying the Bible. And what is that? A Bible, right? And, and so, so this guidance that we're learning here in lesson two really associates itself with that concept of how it is that we go about choosing a Bible in order that we can study it uh, in the best ways possible. And uh, we began that study actually on Wednesday night. We had a good discussion uh, on Wednesday uh, as an introduction to this, this conversation, and we'll continue that, maybe wrap this lesson up uh, this morning uh, as we go through the rest of it. But before we get it, begin, uh, if you would, let's bow our heads together and share in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this uh, wonderful day you've provided for us, an opportunity again to assemble, uh, to study your word, to appreciate your guidance and wisdom. Uh, give us the courage to want to know more from your word, to listen to you, and to appreciate the testimony that you provide for us and the wisdom that you, that you grant unto us through your, your words. Uh, give us a, a heart of receptiveness to it. Uh, encourage us to make application of it. And thank you uh, for your divine wisdom in providing your knowledge to us that guides us every day. Strengthen us in our endeavor this morning to, to study your word at this point and to worship you and honor you throughout our services this morning. And we pray all these things through thy son's name. Amen. So last Wednesday, this past Wednesday, we talked a lot about the idea of translation, right? We, that was our conversation the whole time uh, on Wednesday night about the importance of understanding how these translations came to be. Now, we didn't do a deep dive, by the way. We, we kind of talked very generically about two basic kinds, right? There's word for words, and there's, there's thought for thought. And we've warned us about the fact that when you get into those thought for thought translations, uh, be very careful, right? Because that influence of the scholars that are involved in that can begin to influence uh, the thoughts and the way that that is presented. So again, we talked about that Wednesday. We might come back to that a little bit when we get into the question portion this morning, um, but I don't want to go back and redo that whole lesson that we did on Wednesday. But again, if there's other questions, they can come back up maybe when we get to the questions portion uh, of our study. I do have a little better way last Sunday morning. I tried to give you exactly what you had, and it just didn't work right. Uh, so I've, I've put it in a format now that you can actually see. It's the same thing on your page, only just in a different formatting so that it's easier uh, for me to walk through it with you. And when you see something highlighted, that's kind of where I'm going to pause in relationship to the study and talk a little bit. This, this was written again by David Maxson. There, there's a wealth of information and knowledge he provides. Uh, sometimes I 100% I agree. Sometimes I, I pause and think a little bit about what he says. And, and he even notes that some of it's his opinion and his thoughts. And, and so that's fair uh, as it relates to some uh, of these things. But in picking a Bible to use, there are various kinds, not just translations that you have to kind of think through, but there's also types of Bibles that we need to maybe take a few minutes and talk about. And one of those types is a often referred to as a study Bible. And generally, these have various aspects, and they're all slightly different in relationship to what they might add. But a lot of times they'll do what they call chapter outlines for, for each uh, chapter that might help you along. Um, some might even write or put the verses in paragraphs, um, and that kind of helps you a little bit understand where at least the folks that put that you know, copy out, where they felt like the breaks in the conversation are. And so sometimes that's helpful to kind of give you a little bit of a guidance. Okay, here was, here was a topic that was being discussed, and we've kind of dealt with that, and here's the paragraph that addresses it. Then here's the next paragraph uh, that maybe moves on to another subject or whatever. That can be helpful. Um, there can be supplemental notes. There can be maps. Um, it's, it's interesting because... This material was written quite a while back, and there has been a lot of new sources uh, that have become available to us that weren't necessarily as prevalent when this material was written. 
um, it was pretty common for, for a long time for folks to want a Bible that had a lot of maps in it, right? And so that you could kind of, when they talked about the Jordan River, you could flip to the, remember, your back of your Bible, and you'd flip to the back of your Bible, and you'd find the one on that area, and you'd find the Jordan River, um, or, or whatever it was that was being discussed. With the proliferate, you know, the, with the vast amount of technology that's available to us now, those maps and more information, <laughs> um, we can readily and quickly find that kind of information and share it a lot more rapidly. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember there was probably right over there somewhere a tripod, and it had a, it had a rack, <laughs> and it had Bible maps, and a preacher would go over and he'd flip and he'd flip and he'd flip <laughs> until he found the one he wanted, and then he'd use a wooden stick and he'd... Well, nowadays, instantaneously, I could throw maps on that screen in two seconds, and we could be looking at exactly the areas and places. It's different, but you may want a Bible that has some of that, right? You may want a Bible that has uh, uh, some maps in it. You might want a Bible that has some historical background that can help you. Um, we didn't live in the days of Jesus, and it's important, and I think we can appreciate maybe some of the moments uh, that are taught in better ways if we kind of understand the history of the people and the circumstances they were involved in at the time um, that can produce great value uh, to us. There's expanded indexes to, to, to help. There's concordances. What's a concordance, by the way? Yeah. Where you can find it, right? It, it, pick, pick a word and... and you can look that word up, and it will tell you the verses in the Bible that use that particular word. Now, if you have that in, in, your, in your printed copy, I have in, in the Bible that I preach from, um, when you flip back, I, I have what is a basic concordance. But it is very, 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 very basic. Um, and it will help a little, but again, technology has allowed us now if I pulled up eSword, which when I show you verses on the screen, that's what I'm using. If I pull up eSword in two seconds, I can type in a word. It'll show me every single verse that that word is in throughout the Bible in, in a very, very short order. But if you're not a fan of technology in terms of how you study, if you don't like to sit at a computer and do your study and still like that hard copy Bible in your hands, then a good study Bible with a solid concordance in it could be of value to you so that when you think about, well, I want to I think about some verses that deal with praise or deal with faith or, or prayer or whatever it might be, it's a quick and easy uh, way uh, to do that. There are also volumes, by the way, if you like books, that you can still put your hands on an old, good old-fashioned book. Um, the most popular um, throughout among brethren for years and years and years was, was Strong's Concordance, right? You could go and find, and it was a big old thick volume. It was about this big, and, and most of them were hardbound, and you could keep that at home, and when you wanted to look up where words were, you'd pull it off the shelf, uh, and you would look those things uh, up. Sometimes um, you might need a word defined, and some study Bibles will have some very basic definitions of words um, within that, and yet again, you can find much larger volumes. Uh, Strong's is keyed to 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 Thayer, um, so if you go to, <laughs> I remember doing that when I was first preaching. You'd take Strong's Concordance, you'd find the words you were looking for, and find the verses. Then it would give you a number that would match the Thayer's Greek <laughs> uh, to English di uh, lexicon, and you can match that over and, and get your definition. And then if you weren't quite fulfilled yet, you'd grab Vine's expository dictionary off the shelf and you would look that word up and you would do that. And some of you are probably old enough to maybe have experienced that kind of study. Full disclosure, I don't do that anymore. I, I, I use computer for all of my study and so, so I f have all of those resources at my fingertips instantaneously. And, and I'll share with you what I, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, I use a program called eSword absolutely free. Uh, you can download it to your, your PC. I think there is a small charge. I have it on my phone as well. I think there's a small charge, like a two or three dollar charge, uh, to get it on your phone. But every Bible translation, pretty much, that's in the public domain 
you, you can have access to via the app or the software. Um, Smith's Dictionary, Fawcett's Dictionary, <laughs> um, Thayer's, Strong's Numbered Concordance, you know, just you name it. It's all available in that one piece of software. I remember when I first started preaching and that kind of thing started coming out, software started coming out, um, whew, it was expensive. I mean, I, I mean it, was, it was an investment by preachers to, to spend um, for quick verse, if you remember that, or Logos Bible and some of those. But now there's a lot of stuff out there. There was a guy that just decided that here's all this stuff in the public domain. He had some, some coding skills, and he wrote a piece of software and wanted people to have access to it. And you can donate some money to him uh, if you choose to. I've done that in the past because I've used his software a lot. Um, but, but anyway, that, that kind of thing uh, is available out there. But if you've got a strong, uh, good, solid study Bible, some of that um, can be right there at your fingertips if, again, that's the way you like. <laughs> but, he, but here's the caution. And he, the writer of the material we're using, and, and these cautions are fair, and I think that we need to at least consider them. The, the problem with study Bibles can be that they're, they're influenced by the publishers and the people that are involved when determining what kinds of notes to put in and what kinds of things to add. And he shares an example here. Now, again, Ryrie's study Bible may have changed since he printed this material. So if you have a Ryrie study Bible and you say, well, mine doesn't do that. Well, it's possible it's changed over the decades uh, and, and over time. But, but he cites a, a, a moment where the Ryrie study Bible, which was very popular, had a note on Acts 22, 16. By the way, what does Acts 22, 16 verse say? What's Saul say? Yeah, Saul, Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. That's what Acts 22, verse 16 says. But in that study Bible's note on that passage, it said, baptism does not wash away sins. So, <laughs> that's pretty blatantly contradictory to what the text actually says. And that's when it's become more human commentary. Than, than what the text actually says. Here, here's the other part of that, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. here. Here's the other aspect, and he mentions this as well. You might say, well, I might, somebody in a commentary might say that too. If I went over to the shelf and I pulled off, um, um, and I'm not saying Matthew Henry said the, that, but, but if you pull off Matthew Henry's or you, you pull off the pulpit commentary or you, or you use ESOR, by the way, all that's available on ESOR as well, um, you, you pull up a commentary, it might give you the same bad advice. It, it, a commentary might share with you the same poor conclusion or absolutely false conclusion out of a text that a study Bible did. The difference is, psychologically in a sense, I know that I grabbed this man's commentary off a shelf, and I know what I'm dealing with when I do that. When it's right there in your Bible, I've known people to say, well, it's right there in my Bible, <laughs> right? I've run into folks who see a study note, and when I say, well, that's not really... That's not really in the passage there. And they'll say, oh, yes, it is. It's right here in my Bible. And that's where study Bibles can create problems. When, when people start trusting the notes more than the words in the book, in the verses in Bible uh, itself. So be careful. Just because your study Bible gives you a definition or a note or a thought or some additional information as it relates to some verse doesn't necessarily mean it's right when it does that. So, so be careful. I'll breathe for a second. Thoughts or comments about study Bibles? I just go by the analogy if they compare scripture with spiritual, yeah. spiritual with spiritual. And if, if there's a note like that or any other note, just, well, why does he think that way? Does, yeah. he, does, does that author give any other cross-reference? To, to, is it nullified? Is it not nullified from old to new? And that's just what you have to do. Right. You, you just have to compare what's the authority. And remember, they're biased. Right. Every author is biased. Yeah. And, and, and simply 
compare Scripture to Scripture, right? And you'll, you'll, you'll be able to find answers uh, to what seems like a contradictory thought, then you might find out, yeah, it is. It, 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 there's no, no evidence given as to why they drew that conclusion, uh, other than maybe their bias uh, as it relates to it. Other thoughts you might have? A true writing in the Scripture. We'll, we'll see a counterfeit right away. It'll come up. You'll know it. Yeah. You'll say, that's not right. That's not right. Because you know here's what's in there. Yeah. Yeah. When, we, when we spend, spend quality time in study, we'll, we'll, those things should jump out at us as wrong pretty quickly, the, the more dedicated we are to, to, to those uh, purposes. 48 years ago, Lois and I wanted to buy a study Bible, and it had to be approved by the leaders of that church. Huh? They made certain <laughs> approved it. That's interesting. I, and, and, uh, but I, nothing surprises me anymore, Mike. I used to get shocked and surprised by all kinds of things. Nothing, nothing now. Uh, it, it, but, uh, but that's interesting. But, I, but, you know, and again, I won't make you drive down that personal road, but, but it doesn't surprise me because I, I can see that happening. I can, I can see that kind of authoritative influence uh, happening um, in, in, in some instances. Any, any other thoughts about that? Go ahead, Brian. I forgot what I was going to say. Okay, so what was he saying? I'm sorry, I was trying he to... He just thinks about somebody telling me what Bibles they could use and which ones they couldn't, technically, what you're saying. Okay, it'll come back to All us. Right, we'll we'll come back later. Uh, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. In, especially in King James, it says authorized version. Yeah. It, is that... The, Yes. No, no. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> well, we're gonna we could again. That's the deep dive, and I, if we we'll spend days um, if we want to have a study some night on on that. But but there is argument, and I'm sure, and 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 if you deep dive that, um, but who would have the authority to authorize it? That would be the question, right? Um, it, if you mean authorize, meaning that it is it is accurate and authoritative, then that's one way, one way to define it. But if you're talking about authorized by some source that had power and authority to authorize it, I, my challenge is who has that authority? Um, that's, that's, that's me. I'm just telling what my, me, my answer uh, to your question. But I know Brian's done deep dives on that. Well, I'll, I'll just, I won't go into the rabbit hole right now. But basically, when it came out in 1611, it was the English Bible, 1611. Yeah. Now, King James had nothing to do with the translation. 47 scholars did it. Yeah. So to say King James came up with it is nonsense. Yeah. Um, came, it's 95% of the text is Perceptus. The other, NASB, New King James, NIV, ESV, BLT, sorry, that's a joke. Um, 5% yeah. of the critical text. And that then, but you know, I just look at the evidence too. Um, and um, but no, the authorized name, authorized version, was given by the people later on. It wasn't accepted at first. People had a hard time breaking away from the Geneva Bible, yeah. which that was a study Bible. And the purpose of the of the King James Bible of 1611 was to get rid of all that. Because if you read some of the notes, go online, read the Geneva Bible. Some of the notes are just weird. Yeah. The world would end it 400 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, that, that was the name given by the people, and then it just became the authorized version. So it wasn't in a name given by England or the United right. States. And, you know. Well, and, and the challenge with that, though, is, and I, that's why that question's fair, is because people see that, and they ask the same question I did, right? Who, who by whom? But, but, but I believe you're right. It became known as such because it was that which was accepted in that time period when when there was request for it, right? Um, the, the, the Catholic Roman, you know, the Catholic Church had withheld, and, and, and so here's, you know, there was this request in some ways, give us something that we can have, and again, we can deep dive that sometime, but, uh, but, but so, so King James is obviously involved because it becomes, he becomes the noted, <laughs> individual in relationship to it but 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 he wasn't the one he, in Brian, he's not the one sitting there reading from the original manuscripts and and and, and come back back to it but so to answer to your question yeah, go ahead. Sorry. 
tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I, I read someplace, and it's been many years ago, that the King James Version come about because the king was at odds with the church because of marriage. And I, I, I don't know if that's true, but that's, that's what I that, that's, read at one time. That probably fits more in folklore than it, than it does in any evidentiary place. Um, you know what I mean? It, it, it's a story that's been passed down over the years. I don't know that there's any evidence uh, of, of such. It really does seem to have come from, from this conflict with control over, over God's Word and who could have access. And so in an effort to allow the people to have access, this translation comes to be. Um, that's really the reason. But, but they're going to have to have some, some kind of authoritative voice to let them do it. And some, in some ways, some protections uh, as it relates, because this was not going to go over well. Um, and so, so who can I get to protect us while we do this? Well, we'll get King James on, on board with us so that, so that we can make this translation into English without threat, or at least with some protections as it relates to it. A struggle of power in England at the time. Yeah, yeah. In, in relationship to, to the universal church, right, and, and, the, and the control over, um, over, the, over the text. The people from the priest wanted to come and say, we need to have a set standard. Because there were several things going around. Like we had the Deuter Reims of 1610, which is the Catholic Bible. And that came a year before the King James was even finished. And so it took seven years for the King James Bible to be finished. Each portion of scripture went through 14 tests, seven years, and uh, over you know, seven different iterations from the Hebrew Bible, Tyndale Bible, and, the, and then the King James was the seventh. And, um, but what I was saying about the study Bible thing, I wanted to give, I'm sorry, uh, when he was saying about, you know, someone said that, uh, you know, they had to approve the study Bible and stuff. It is really hard, and I've checked, even with King James Bibles or any version for that matter. It's hard to find a Bible just with plain text. Yeah. No center column, no notes, no commentary, not even a concordance. Yeah. Try to find it. Yeah. I've only known a couple of companies that it's, it's weird. Right. And Thomas Nelson and Zondervan, Harper Collins, 55% of all Bible publishers in the world. Yeah. Rupert, Rupert, Rupert Murdoch owns all of them. Yeah. It, it, it is hard, and I think you're right. When we're talking about finding a Bible, it's kind of hard to, to be able to find one that's not going to have something in it that you're going to have to be cautious about um, as, as we move forward. The other style of, is margin note Bibles, and, and those are a little more extensive than study Bibles. Um, they they uh, maybe give you a more literal translation. That when you'll find notes like this, remember we talked Wednesday night about the fact that baptismo was transliterated, and and uh, and we didn't we had an English word. They just didn't chose for whatever reason to transliterate it instead. Instead of using immersion or submerge, that was the definition that could have been. Well, what a marginal note Bible might do is show you that it, it might give you a reference that that word if it was, had been literally translated, would have said immersion. Um, that's the kind of thing you'll find um, in a margin note uh, Bible, maybe some kind of comparative Hebrew-Greek text uh, things. Sometimes they'll give you things like, uh, you know, what, how much was, um, now I'm trying to think of an, right, how much was a shekel, how much was an ephod, right? right? Those, those, those biblical weights and measures and monetary things, Sometimes a marginal note Bible will help you out and give you a little bit of reference as to which uh, of these things uh, or what those measurements would equivalent to or be the equivalent to in our modern times. Um, it gets really confusing when it does it in metric, and then we folks in America who refuse to do anything metric um, be because tens are just way too easy, or, um, but, uh, and we don't like it that way. We like complicated math. Um, so anyway, um, but then it can get tricky. But, but anyway, that, that's what those kinds of things do. I think when we're using these extra helps, I think we need to also look up the person that's writing it. 
like yeah. the fair. We use him a lot, or the fair, and I think let's yeah. look, look, look him up and see what his beliefs are. But whoever's authorized, you know, yeah. actually putting these books out, we need a history on what their beliefs are and yeah. which way, because sometimes they'll lean one way or the other. Sure. And, and, and you, it wouldn't take you long. You, do, you should really do that with everything, right? The, the commentator, you'll, you'll get a you'll get a much better understanding of why they concluded what they did if you know at least a little bit about the, the historical background of, of those writers because it is, it is hard to, to remove human bias. It, 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 I mean, the fact of the matter is, if I was to write something of that sort, I guarantee you that at some point in time, my lifetime of built-in biases about certain things or built-in conclusions about certain things would eventually come out uh, in that. And so, so it, it is important, I think, if we, if we have the ability to understand a little bit of the background of those folks, um, it can help. There's cross-reference um, Bibles, and those are just basically trying to show you connectivity, right? Here's a, here's a verse, and here's some, maybe it's just the, the exact same account of the same event in a different gospel account, right? It may, it may give you a cross-reference, or it'll tie you to, if they're quoting the Old Testament, it'll show you, well, this is where in the Old Testament they were quoting from. That's, that's the kind of information you might find uh, in a cross-reference type uh, of Bible. He talked a little bit about, uh, you know, I, and so I, I noticed I don't have anything highlighted there, but he did talk a little bit about binding. I know nothing about, about that kind of thing, but I do know this, that, that the truth is, the cheaper it is, the cheaper it is, right? If, if it's imitation leather um, and those kinds of things, it, it's, it's going to crack. It's, it, the binding's going to come apart. You know, if, if, but the, the real question is, and well, let me get to that. I, I, I'll share with you what I mean by when, when, we, uh, um, when we make those, those choices. Let me, I'm going to come back to the questions. I had put them there because I thought that's where I'd break. Um, but let me, let me do this instead. Um, no. <laughs> I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> let me, <laughs> I'm not going to get lesson two done. I'm going to have to come back to it Wednesday, at least to finish it. Um, I don't think in eight minutes. But, uh, but so let, let's just, we can do this quickly, though, because we kind of already rehashed this. So what are the two fundamental methods of translation? Word for word and thought for thought, or we often call that a, a paraphrase. Yeah. Well, the real, <laughs> the, the academics do. <laughs> is, is either kind perfect? No. But it is, is one more accurate than the other type. Yeah, word for word, right? Word for word. Um, and, and you're going to find a lot fewer, in fact, with some translations, rare um, issues. Um, and, and that's why we've studied throughout our study, and the author of this book, the, this material said, <laughs> I didn't write the questions. <laughs> but no, I would, the question I, I would ask is, believe the original is inspired. Yeah. Well, you thought Timothy had Jesus, if Jesus is in, you know, Jesus was, they were not the original. <laughs> well, anyway. Well, no, no, I, well, I define original as I guess is what I meant, but if I had understood what you meant by original, I, I, I get what well, you Well, no, I'm sorry. I'm no, you're good. You're well, good. I, I can keep going. I get it. So, so what's the advantage of deep, we'll deep dive it sometime. I'm going to, we'll hold a class and we'll really dig. Um, what's the advantage of a study Bible? Yeah, just additional helps, right? Additional helps. The disadvantage is they, they, they could be wrong, right? They could, they could grab biases. Um, and it might lend me to not work very hard personally. Um, I, just keep tr I just trust whatever somebody wrote in my study Bible, and that's good enough for me, and I, I don't spend a lot of time on my own. Um, and the same thing with marginal notes. You'll find those cross-references, uh, and those things are certainly uh, helpful uh, at times. He says then the next important thing in his opinion to the Bi having a, a good solid Bible is to have a, a notebook. Um, 
you can record sermon notes, you can, your, your own reflections of, the, of scriptures as you study it. Um, and, and the intent of that is, is that writing down your thoughts can actually help sharpen your mindset ab- about study. Um, it has been proven, by the way, that if you, if you add those senses, right, educators will tell you that, that the, it, the more of the senses that you employ in, in something, the better off you are. And so if I've, I've used my eyes, I've used my ears, I may, and I, if I use my hands and I'm, I'm writing, uh, though all of those things uh, can be beneficial uh, in your effort, and it can help you kind of solidify those things in your minds that when you want to recall them later, um, it's a lot easier uh, to do. I, I consider myself an anomaly in a whole lot of things in this world. <laughs> and I, that is not something I've done over the years, by the way. Um, it, it's, it's, and I'm not telling you not to do it, and I'm telling you, you probably would benefit. It just was something that was not part of my brain makeup um, to do that. Um, I, I, I do take some notes. Um, generally, I type them. I don't, I, don't, I don't think I own a notebook, to my knowledge. Um, but, uh, uh, nor did I in high school, but that's a whole other story. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but, but here's the point. Find a way. Find a way. Maybe it's a notebook. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a computerized journal. Maybe it's, but find a way to help you etch the thoughts and intents of Scripture I- into your mind. For me, it's repetition. That's how I do it. I, I just keep going back, and I keep going back, and I keep going back, and I keep going back and, until I, I feel like it's ingrained in, in, into my being in some senses um, because uh, I, I, it's, just, it's just my way. But, but I think he's right that, that a good, solid notebook... Uh, can help you have uh, a solid uh, approach towards study. And that question there um, kind of self-answers itself. Sometimes you come across scripture and you have a question, you can always write those down and keep record, and then you can yeah. ask someone else, someone so you can talk to someone about yeah. it. And I do that. I actually do that. I'll, I'll, uh, I, and more and more, as I'm getting older, I have to do it more and more to write down what people ask me or a thought that comes up. Um, I'm, uh, it, it's funny, I, I try, I, when, when I take, try, I try to take notes, and when I was a kid, by the way, it's sit right up here, um, I wish I still had them, I could, I could share with you piles and piles and piles and piles of notes that I took when I was a kid, uh, of various preachers, um, that I would listen to. I, I took notes as a kid a lot, maybe that's why I don't now, I don't know, but, uh, but, uh, but, but uh, anyway, it, it, can be, it can be really helpful. I, my problem is, as a preacher, if I start trying to take notes during somebody else's sermon, I promise you two minutes in, I'll be writing my own sermon. <laughs> They'll say something, and I'll go, oh, that's good. And I'll go, I know what I'd do with that. And here I go. And so I have to be careful. I, when I do, what I do is I pull my phone out, which Deborah despises when I do that in, 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 in the when I'm sitting in the pew, sorry, I, you know, I forgot you're in the class right now. Um, but uh, but she doesn't like it when I use my my phone Bible or or any and I write notes and stuff like that. But anyway, but I do that. I'll, if I hear something that's that I think, oh, that I that's an interesting perspective on that verse. I'll write that down real quick, but I'll put my phone away then, because that way I'm not tempted to just sit there and write the whole thing. <laughs> I'll jot down what triggered it. So those are good things. So if you carry a notebook with you. It can be helpful for those purposes. There's publishers who make Bibles that are interleave ends, and they also have what they call note takers Bible, yeah. where every page has a note section. They're thicker Bibles, yeah. but they have a section where you can run on every page. Right. And, and that kind of leads us into this next paragraph, this next portion, and that is, is writing in your Bible a good or a bad thing? It, it, it depends, right? It, 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 as far as appropriate, it's perfectly appropriate. Um, there's nothing wrong. You're not adding to the Bible by writing down a note um, inside uh, the Scriptures. He made what I thought was some interesting observations um, about it. Uh, I did not, for some reason, didn't highlight them here for you. But, but one of the comments he made was the ch- struggle could be, depending on how long you keep that Bible, 
maybe the thought you had 20 years ago isn't the same thought you had 20 years later. Now what? Um, what happens if I bought a cheap Bible <laughs> and, 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 and the binding is destroyed? Um, I, I can remember my, my mom wept <laughs> when her Bible finally disintegrated um, because she had done that. She had taken notes and wrote things down, and we, we searched the world to find the exact same Bible so that she could just transpose everything exactly into the same spots. And I think we finally did somewhere, maybe. But, but anyway, it, it can create a problem, right, as it relates to that. But some people like to do that. Also be careful, though, I would hope that the Bible would be interesting enough that by, by after some level of uh, years of study, your whole Bible is going to be what? It's all going to be marked, right? And, and, and I, it's all going to be marked and highlighted and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and, and the benefit of that may fade uh, over, over time. Um, and and, and so, so keep that in mind. I remember when, when Jill went to, to Florida College, she, I didn't realize at the time, but Dad must have given her my copy of the New American Standard uh, Bible uh, that, that um, Bertie Mae Farley had given to me here um, when I was seven years old. And, and, and the way I found out she had had it, because it finally ended up back with me, but I can't remember what the text was, but I got to some passage and I'm like, I don't write in my Bible, <laughs> and that's not my handwriting. <laughs> where she had taken some notes in her Bible classes down at Florida College. It's not, again, I may be the anomaly, and it's okay. I don't, I've never done that. I just don't. Um, it's, it's a personal thing with me, um, but it may help you uh, to jot down things. Or maybe you know what, you've, you come across a cross-reference that your Bible doesn't show you. And you want to know, when you come back to, to you know, Acts 22, you want to remember... When, when Saul encountered Ananias uh, in reality in Acts chapter, he's recounting it in 22, it happened in 9, right? So you may want to remember that. You may want to put down a note about that that might not be uh, in your Bible. Those are all positive things um, that, that, that could happen. We almost made We talked about some of these things. I'll, I'll briefly... Um, I'll briefly talk about but so so prep a little bit into chat into lesson three. I, I think I'm pretty sure since I've covered some of this already um, in some of the earlier conversations. So we'll 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 talk a little bit about the rest of this. Um, but I do believe that I can get into at least lesson begin lesson three with you as well on Wednesday. Thank you all for the comments. Some